And maybe the first or second time you, you see their body or you, in our instance, see someone shot blown up, that leaves a bit of a um, impression. But by the time you hit your 10th, 20th, 30th dismembered body or blown apart person or um, you know high velocity gunshot wound, it doesn't even register. And because you become desensitized and say- so, uh, but because it doesn't register, does that mean it doesn't go somewhere? No. No, this is the thing. So it doesn't consciously register, mm. but subconsciously it's going in. That's Dan Pronk. He served four tours of Afghanistan as a special operations doctor, spending many days saving and losing fellow soldiers through more than 100 combat missions. We were surrounded, so we'd, we'd got ourselves into this village and we were receiving fire from all directions. Dan, his brother Ben and veteran Tim Curtis have just released their book, The Resilient Shield, a mix of enthralling stories and practical instructions, breaking down methods we can all use to build genuine resilience. Those neurotransmitters and hormones, we can change our emotional state and allow them to dissipate and change, our, or we can perpetuate them. Dan thrived in the most extreme high-stress environments and found the rampant intensity of battle so enticing that he felt he had to keep going back for more. When he was in the thick of it, witnessing all the death and destruction seemed like water off a duck's back, but Dan's trauma was building all along till it finally caught up with him. And all of a sudden, here I am earning stack more cash. I'm safe, I'm home, I'm with my kids, with my wife, and, and everything's rosy on paper, but yet I was really struggling. Dan is a prime example of post-traumatic growth, the positive flip side of post-traumatic stress we don't often hear about. This is becoming a better version of yourself because of the trauma. It's recalibrating, it's a renewed appreciation for life. Very few of us have survived the worst of the worst like Dan has, but we all face challenges in our lives with the potential to break us, and we all need a resilient shield. To try and break resilience down into something that was usable. Welcome to Young Blood, an award-winning podcast on a mission to make the mental health of young men a top priority. My name's Callum McPherson, I'm a journalist, and this is our platform to open up and share stories of what we've been through because we're not alone. Let's do it. Before we kick this off, I just want to say thanks so much to everyone who's taken 15 to 90 seconds out of their day to rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts. It boosts us up the ranks massively and makes a huge difference to how many people we can reach with these potentially life-saving stories. So thank you. And for those who haven't got around to it, please, if Youngblood has delivered you some value, let us know on there. Cheers, legends. This episode is sponsored by Bolton Brothers, the guys dedicated to changing the face of men's mental health, and Ski for Life, the organisation promoting mental health and suicide prevention through their annual ski relay in South Australia. Check out their websites and follow them on socials. Dan, Helmand Province, Afghanistan, 2011. Take us through the most fierce firefight that you ever experienced. It was certainly the most intense firefight that I'd been in to that point. We'd been launched into a mission to clear an enemy stronghold, and it was going to be a 48-hour on-target mission. We had a, quite a large force, and we inserted very close to the target in the middle of a period of darkness with the intent of getting off the helicopters fast and hitting this target and establishing ourselves in pre-designated compounds and, and basically just fighting for 48 hours. And, and we, this was a compound full of Taliban? It was a village full of Taliban, yeah. So there was an overarching strategic intent to try and, and uh, break up this Taliban stronghold. And our task group got the mission of, of softening them up, if you like, as part of a bigger strategic objective to then roll through. I think the US Marines were going to come through and and clear this uh, village, which they'd been having a lot of problems with. The enemy were consolidating there and training there and launching missions out of there. And, and so we'd, we'd gotten in that night and we inserted, so a group called the, the 160th, so an American uh, Special Operations Aviation Regiment put us in very close to the, and very fast and got off the, the Chinooks and raced to the side of this village. And within seconds of hitting the deck, we were receiving heavy machine gun fire from the village. So they were ready. Uh, they were ready for us and well postured. And, and then pretty soon after that, they started firing uh, rocket propelled grenades, RPGs at us, uh, that they were air bursting. They were quite good at their craft uh, to, to give them the credit that was due. They knew how to use their weapons and and we, so we got into into the target during that night, and and then things settled a little bit. And then on first first light the following morning, as was the trend, uh, things just erupted. And so massive day of fighting throughout that day, middle of summer in Afghanistan. So it was very hot. The temperatures were going up into the mid to high forties, and 
And intense fighting, we, we, it sounds far more dramatic than it actually was, but we were surrounded. So we'd, we'd got ourselves into this village and we were receiving fire from all directions. Uh, we were in our compounds and, and well established to, to fight from there and started to send out some clearance patrols on that day and, and thankfully didn't sustain any casualties on that first day. Into the evening, we were running quite low on ammunition. We'd um, we'd we'd probably kicked a, a bit bit of a bigger hornet's nest than we anticipated, and mm. so more fighting than we'd predicted, and needed to get an ammunition resupply that night. So a, a Hercules a aircraft came in and kicked out a big pallet of ammunition and and uh, water. Actually, we were running a little bit low on water, so we resupplied throughout the night. There was a bit of a lull in that period of darkness. And it, it, as it transpires, the enemy had reinforced throughout that night. And so the, the next day when first light hit, it kicked off again. And it was, it was a, sort of a bigger gunfight even once again. And as a problem. doctor, are you fighting? Look, the, it wasn't my primary role. It wasn't my primary role. So my primary role, of course, was there to be close to the, the point of injury if we sustained casualties. But the reality was there were, were times where everyone just needed to be involved in the, the gunfight and that was one of those times. So yeah, it wasn't, I was never the first bloke through the door. That made no sense, but, uh, I, I, you know, I was there as a, a soldier like anyone else, but with that, with that, my primary function being to respond to combat casualties. And into the second day, how did that progress? So it started once again, a, a first light, it just, the village erupted again and, and the enemy started to probe our positions and we started to move clearance forces out to to try and clear their positions. And uh, I think it might've been about midday we started to take casualties. So a couple of our guys were trying to clear a compound and, and the enemy threw a grenade, which, uh, which fragged two of these blokes. And, and one guy caught a, a bunch of uh, frag through his arm and another guy caught some through the side of his chest. And so I responded to those guys and we, uh, thankfully they weren't too badly uh, wounded. So, but we, we stabilized them, evacuated them. Another one of our guys took a, a bad um, bit of fra frag from a rocket into his the front of his lower leg, which blew a big chunk out of there and, and took a big chunk out of the bone. And so stabilised them and got them on a aeromedical evacuation helicopter, which received a, a bunch of heavy fire. It's it, um, you know to their credit, they came in knowing they were going to get well shot up, and and the enemy had a good go at them and managed to get these guys on the helicopter. As the afternoon progressed. There was a series of machine gun positions in an enemy compound uh, that were, was really causing us trouble. And four, a four-man clearance patrol had moved forward into that compound to, to try and clear those positions. And uh, unfortunately, as they moved through and cleared that compound, the lead man from that patrol uh, stepped on a, a large improvised explosive device. And, and that was a really pivotal moment. Uh, for me, the response to that. So I formed up as part of a quick reaction force and we've moved forward to respond to those four who had all been, uh, the, the lead man was, was horrifically injured. Uh, and, but the, the, the bloke behind him in the stack had, had copped a fair bit of shrapnel as well. And then the other two a bit further back had just copped a blast wave, which was significant. And when you entered and you saw that that was one of your mates, how did that register in your brain at that moment? Look, it didn't. It didn't register at all that this was one of my mates at that point. It was a very uh, robotic and emotionless response, and which it, it was how it needed to be. It was it was that textbook scenario where the training kicks in, and I could see a medical problem that needed solving. That was plain and simple how I saw it, and and. I'd been afforded a really comprehensive training to allow me to approach these situations under duress. And thankfully, those skills were there for me on the day. And so I approached and just fell into the, the sequence of uh, what we call tactical combat casualty care and that, um, that, that management of the, the wounds that, mm. that presented themselves and, and trying to do everything we could to, to stop the preventable causes of death. And his limbs were blown off. And you say in the book, you saw the light leave his eyes and that reality hit you like a sledgehammer at that point. In among that sequence of trying to uh, save that soldier, it's somewhere in there, it, it registered. I, I was kneeling over his, his head and, and uh, we were doing our processes to try and stop the bleeding and, and, and uh, resuscitate this bloke and save him. 
And and at some point in among that, I I remember looking at his face and it registered who this guy was and, you know, that it was a, a mate of mine and, and a, a mate of mine who that very morning had been the bloke that I was working with coordinating the aeromedical evacuation. So it's it, that, that really hit home at the point, but all all the other stuff about that being a, a turning point, that all came later. The The reality was in that scenario, we, we still had a job to do and uh, even once it became clear that that we'd lost that soldier. We were still in in among a, a gunfight. We were then dislocated from our main force. The enemy knew we were pinned down in this compound. They were starting to probe us, and some of our guys were starting to have some really uh, close quarters engagements with the enemy as they were trying to move in. So they knew we were bogged down with casualties and that we were dislocated from our main force. And so there was no... There was no, it wasn't the time or place to, no. to start trying to process that. It's okay, well, this, and, and it sounds horrendously callous, but, but that, that uh, dead soldier became then a, a, logistical, uh, a logistical challenge. How do we, how do we extract now with, with, this, uh, with our, our friend here and also try and manage the other casualties as best as we can to get the best outcome for them, but we needed to to just consolidate and get out of there and get back to our main force and, and try and evacuate the other guys. When you reflect, did things change for you after that? Yeah, they did. And that, that reflection came a lot later. So the, it was in a way a fantastic environment in that there was plenty of distraction. So there wasn't the opportunity to dwell on anything that happened. And so we finished up that mission maybe somewhere around midnight or in the early hours of the, the after the, the period of darkness, sort of 48 hours in, extracted, got back to base, went through the, the process of, of the mortuary affairs type process and, and handing over our, our uh, mate's body to the, the appropriate authorities. And, and then by, by that time- Did you feel it? How did you feel it in that 48 hours then? Look, I didn't. I didn't. It didn't register. And so my focus at that point was uh, to the, another mission. And so I ended up finishing up maybe four o'clock in the morning by the time I got back to our camp uh, from the American surgical facility that we'd done the processing of the, the body. And, and I was due out on another mission at 6.30 that morning. So I packed my, like repacked my kit cleaned my stuff, scrubbed all the, the blood off my, my mm. kit and repacked it all, tried to have a sleep, couldn't, uh, got up and went on another mission. And so that, that was the, the, uh, the tempo. Yeah. Of, just of never we had, doing. never had time to, yeah. to think about it. Yeah. So was distraction your coping mechanism at that time w without you knowing that? Yeah. Look, I think it was absolutely. And it, and it was a very effective one and it's, and it, you know, not, it's not just me, it's the, the whole task group. This, this bloke, uh, I, I knew him, but there was other blokes who had been pretty much you know, career-long friends and, and best mates with this guy, his teammates that knew him much more closely. And, and the, the machine had to keep churning. You know, we, we hadn't, still had a job to do and you couldn't just down tools because we'd, we'd lost this guy. It needed to be registered, and indeed, we we had a, a, a wake and a, a, what we call a ramp ceremony, so a very... A sort of poignant ceremony where we'd all form up and you know, wear our berets and, and the, the casket in the back of one of our uh, long-range patrol vehicles would pass slowly through our base and we'd all salute it as it came past and then fall in behind it and go down to the, the airstrip at, at uh, Tarrancout at the, the multinational base there that our special operations task group was based out of. And the casket to get loaded onto a Hercules and then that would take off and we'd all salute. And so it was a very poignant sort of uh, recognition of the loss. And, but then it, there was no downtime really after that. You had to get back into your, your targeting operations. Mm. So distraction works as a Band-Aid, mm. but past that, why doesn't it work mid to long term in terms of being able to deal with your feelings and your emotions and processing. Why can't you just continue to distract yourself ongoing? Well, I think a lot of people do and probably do it pretty well for a period of time. The, the issue there is exactly as you said, it's a Band-Aid approach. It's like you know something's bad in a room, so you shut the door and lock it 
it doesn't make that bad thing go away. Mm. Uh, so you, at some point you need to open the door and, and actually work out what that bad thing is and, and see if you can work out some more adaptive coping strategies to process those events as opposed to the more maladaptive, which are the distractions, the anxious avoidance, don't, don't think about it or don't go near your triggers that are going to make you think about it or pouring alcohol on the problem. They are all coping strategies, mm. but they're maladaptive. They, they don't get you any closer to processing the trauma. They just delay it. And it builds under the surface to a tipping point where it's going to erupt. Yeah, for some people, I think, yeah, whether or not it, it necessarily builds or it doesn't, uh, it's, it, the, the fact is it's, it's still there. Mm. And I think any human unit, if you end up just stacking uh, trauma after trauma after trauma, and it's like filling a, a bucket, I think is a great analogy, a psychological bucket. And, and you can fill that up to a point, you probably won't notice that. And I think this is a big issue with why a lot of people uh, don't process psychological trauma is they don't think they're accumulating it. Mm. And I was one of those for the longest time. I, I, it was all, it all seemed like a wa water off a duck's back. Yeah. And, and I think to a point we can all fill that uh, psychological bucket, but, and then it starts to overflow. And by the time it does, the, the horse is kind of bolted and you're playing catch up. And then you have cases of people experiencing going through episodes and not understanding where it's coming from and the yes. confusion of that, which is pretty yeah. common with PTSD. Yes. So you served four tours. How did your thinking around what you were experiencing differ from one tour to the next? And was there a particular tour where your mindset was fully shifted? Did it happen gradually or did you sort of think about them all the same? No, it, I approached them very differently. So my first rotation was, was fantastic. It was, it was the realization of a long-term career ambition for me to join special operations and then to deploy on operations with that construct. And, and so I was just so excited to, to be there, to be a part of it. It was all new. It was all very shiny. And then while we did a, a decent amount of fighting during that tour, we didn't, we didn't get anyone killed. So there was lots of close calls. There was a few people shot, but none killed. And for me, I think I came away from that with this false sense of security, this m maybe a, a naive sense of invulnerability. And, mm. and I didn't uh, realize the magnitude of, of the risk at that point. And, and then it was on that second rotation where that, that instance that we just spoke of occurred. And, and then shortly after that, we, uh, we, we had an, another guy killed. And then shortly after that one, we had another guy killed. And so I was in the field for all of these uh, instances. And I started to, to realize that, no, hang on a sec, we're, we're playing for keeps here. And, and were you working on those guys? Yeah, I did on, on, uh, on one of the others, the, the, uh, one was killed instantly. He was, he was unfortunately uh, shot straight through the, the head and there was nothing we could do about that, but we, we recovered him. Uh, so yeah, it, it, that period of time, which occurred over about a, a six week period where we had those three instances where we lost guys and, and in two of those instances, well, actually all three, we, we had other casualties. We had other people shot. We had a, another one of our snipers shot through the neck and, and superimposed on that was responding to partner force, uh, our Afghan partner force in, in among that period had, had gone to, uh, investigate and try and defuse a big improvised explosive device and had a mass casualty incident. There was a constant stream of trauma coming through the local uh, Ford surgical team who we worked closely with. And so it was this perfect storm of just trauma after trauma after trauma and which from a, a medical professional perspective was just amazing. It was this, this learning curve and this opportunity to experience all this, this fantastic uh, professional uh, challenges, if you like, and, and practice mm. these skill sets that against things like uh, high velocity gunshot wounds and blast that we really don't see much, if any, of in Australia, thankfully. So it was these unique medical experiences and the opportunity to try and use that skill set in a, a complex environment that was. And were you huge. conscious of having to view it that way for yourself to be able to cope with how awful that was and see it as? opportunities to practice the skills that you dedicated so much time to learning were you thinking like that or no not at all I, I thinking just at thought, all <laughs> no i thought this is the best you yeah. know it was just so stimulating and so rewarding and and so uh it was the ultimate forum for me to to test myself mm. and to 
employ a skill set that I'd spent years and years and years learning in, in really high stakes environments and complex environments. And I, I thrived on it. Mm. The, like I said before, the, the, that's what you were there to do. Yeah. It was what I was there to do. And you know, the analogy gets thrown around, it's almost cliched, but it's like a, a professional athlete training for, for, for their whole lives and never mm. getting to play a game. And, and so we, we were there, we were playing a game and mm. it was well, not a game. Yeah. I don't mean to, to diminish what was happening, but this, this was our sort of grand final. Yeah, if you like, the, and, the real yeah. deal. Yeah. 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 Was that the heaviest of the four? The, Sorry, what's that? The there? second tour was that. Ah, uh, yeah, it was. Yeah, so it and uh, that was really pivotal, and and it wasn't until after that tour that I started to process that when I got home and and started to slow down a little bit and and be able to think about what was happening, and and that was where the I guess the first dip, if you like, the first realization that 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 bucket was probably starting to fill occurred, but then it. It seemed to me that the obvious solution was to get back to Afghanistan. It seemed like I had some, I felt like I had some unfinished business. Or That's so I, common, isn't it? Yeah, I think it is. I think it is. And the, so the, the overwhelming desire was to get back. And so the, the very first opportunity I got, I, I went back and-, and Which deployed. civilians wouldn't be able to understand. No, maybe not. It's, it, it is odd. And yeah, I think it, it is terribly difficult to- uh, explain to to someone who who may not have been in that environment or or had those same motivations or been part of that uh, high performance to- close knit team mm. dynamic that that that's all you want to do and somewhere in there that becomes your primary focus and I suppose it's you know, it's like like a drug in a way mm. it's you it's, well the intensity of the stimulus and the intensity of the brotherhood mm. nothing is going to compare to it yeah and I suppose you become acclimatized to that then when that's missing. Yeah. How does that feel? Yeah, you're exactly right. And, and that, that's the thing. And, and when that started to become missing, when I discharged from the army, that was, was where I really got a bit uh, wobbly for a few years there. And, and I think there was a lot of factors involved there, uh, the, the loss of identity and that being uncoupled from that close-knit social support network that was the, at that point, um, the special operations community. And, and not feeling like you're understood, not feeling like you, you, you fit in as you used to and just trying to, and, and basically not knowing who you are out of that role. I, I fell into that trap of, of my identity fusing with my role. I, I associated myself as a, a doctor with those organizations. And, mm. and then when that was gone, I was, I was a bit lost and my, my self-esteem took a bit big hit. But while I was in that environment, it's the, solution that I saw to the, the problem was get back there, get back there. It was like I had some maybe unfinished business. I'm not sure, uh, but I just wanted to get back. And so, yeah, kept, kept deploying, but certainly the, I did approach my role with a far more, uh, I guess, eyes open understanding of the, the risk. And along that five year period that I worked with special operations, we, uh, we had, and had our second son. So I had a young son before I deployed the first time. We'd had a second child uh, who I'd, I'd deployed 10 days after he was born on that, that second rotation and then came back, you know, six, seven months later. And, and so it, it was all starting to my perspective on the, the risk of the role and then the significance of me potentially uh, being injured or killed. That awareness of what you had to lose. Yeah, and not so much what I had to lose, and I think most soldiers will say the same thing that it's it was never really that consideration. I guess if if you got killed, you don't know anything of it. What (laughs) what your family had to lose. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, the the broader significance of what I was doing, and and to some degree the selfishness of Mm -hmm. it, because I loved it, and it it was for me the most professionally rewarding period of my life to date. I haven't found anything that's come even remotely close to it since. And so I wanted to go, yeah. but then the, the flip side of that was looking at, at the, the young family and, and looking at these mates of mine who had been killed in the line of duty, who had wives and kids and, mm. and uh, mums and dads and looking at that, that human uh, cost for those that remain and starting to, to think about those factors. How much were you a different man going in in 09 to going out in 13? Oh, completely different. Yeah. So it's, uh, that, that fundamentally changed me 
as a, a human being in in a lot of ways. Uh, it it I think the the most profound was just the gratitude for what we have, not just in in the first world in Australia, uh, but what I have as a as a human being. The things that you take for granted until you see. The, the flip side of that and how bad it, it can go. You mm. know, it's, it's, you know, I've got, a, got a, a couple of mates who lost their legs over there. And so simple things like being grateful for having legs, you, you, <laughs> the average person doesn't think of that, but then you, you see uh, these things happen. And, and I think everyone who deployed will acknowledge that it, it wasn't, I, I'm not here in one piece because I was a good soldier, far from it. These these blokes that we lost were exponentially better soldiers than me. It's not about good soldier, bad soldier. It's it's just sometimes- Place and time. Dumb luck. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Whether a bullet zips past you or goes through your head is, uh, you know, can be a breath of wind from 300 meters on the day. It's, uh, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, lot of luck. Did you have a few moments where you came pretty close? Yeah, look, I did. I did. Yeah, as as all of us did. If there's enough uh, lead flying around the place, it's um, you, you will have close calls. And there was a number of times where I was shot at very, very accurately. Where I, I, I amongst other people, ran down alleyways that were littered with IEDs, and none of us struck them. And yeah, so there was. I was in a helicopter that fell out of the sky on one occasion, and thankfully, uh, no one was severely injured. But mm. yeah, so there there was all those. Uh, close calls that, that, like I said, it's not unique to me. Everyone in the task group had that. Are you a man of faith? Not traditionally. I'm spiritual without being religious. Yeah. Yeah. I, so, I, yeah. So I, I, and I think my brother and I were raised in that fashion. Uh, you know, mum tried to get us to church and we'd, we'd suffer through church on Christmas and yeah. Easter because that's what we had to do to unwrap our presents. But, <laughs> but um, that didn't last. And, but my dad was same sort of thing. He was not a religious man, but he was a very spiritual man. He was, he was, and so that was instilled in us. And yeah, I've got a, a firm belief in, in something bigger. I don't know what that is, but um, yeah. I am. Did you feel connected to it while you were over there? Not really. No, I don't think so. I, I think probably that uh, that's come with a lot of the reflection and, and as you know, I guess most of us is particularly men as we enter middle age, we do a lot of that soul searching and reflecting and, and, uh, and so I think my spirituality and, and finding things like mindfulness and meditation, I've, I've been late to the game there. I've only embraced that in the last few years as a, a pretty much a last resort when all my maladaptive coping strategies weren't working. Mm. And, and so that's not something that was, was with me during my military service. Uh, but, but that said, I guess the, from a mindful perspective, there was lots of time spent in flow states that sort of in the zone and mm. very focused. And I think that was part of the addictive nature of the role was when you were, when, when I found myself in those uh, high consequence environments where there was was combat casualties in, in that in that space and you, everything else falls away. Yeah. So you and are, part of that's pleasurable. Oh, as hard as that is to yeah. understand, human beings look to get into a flow state. Yes. However, they do that, and that's where you found it. Yes, and then definitely you can get addicted to that because, in some ways, does that feel like that's you at your best in that environment? As horrible as objectively people would say that it is. Yeah, exactly right. And when you look at Maslow's hierarchy, he talks about that self-actualized state, which is the the epitome, the the uh, the peak of his pyramid there, and that's you being the best version of yourself you can be. And for me, I found that in those environments, it was the ultimate uh, rush, and mm. it 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 was hugely addictive, and it could lead to these. With hindsight, what were these really uh, challenging sort of situations to psychological psychologically process whereby I could be in one of those environments treating a, a casualty be it one of our own guys or or local nationals or a, you know an enemy fighter that had been had been injured Geneva Convention dictates that we looked after them too and and we could have a disastrous outcome for the patient and so that that person might die but if I had responded well and gone through my process as well and done everything as I should and used my techniques well, used my, my equipment well, I could come out of it feeling euphoric. Like mm -hmm. that, that was a really positive experience for me personally and professionally. 
but the consequence and the outcome was disastrous. And so you end up- You're separating the two. Yeah, but you end up with this, this horrendous guilt where you, you, I've reflected on quite a number of scenarios where we had disastrous outcomes, but I felt, felt I'd it. performed well. I felt I'd, I'd really risen to the occasion and mm. everything I did was successful, but the outcome was not successful. We got beaten by the injuries. And so you end up with reflecting on- the horrific traumatic death of a human being with positive uh, sort of emotion. And that's, that's Very can, be, <laughs> can be a bit conflicting. Yeah. yeah. So maladaptive rumination, that was a big mm. issue for you. How did that change your brain? I got stuck on loop as I think many of us do. There's a human bias called negativity bias and we're, we're wired to look back on things. That's what the news and, is based on. It is. Yeah. And we, we, fixate on the negatives and so we might have had an experience that was was had some negative aspects to it but a lot of positive aspects as well but but human nature is to fixate on those negatives and and I found myself doing that there was a lot of particularly with the the blokes uh, task group guys that I'd responded to and and that hadn't uh, survived I was found- this during or after Oh, after yeah. yeah. So there was none of this during. It was no. yeah. It was that reflection after and and the that period of time, particularly between when you have a, a an incident and someone loses their life, and and then you get the the outcome of the autopsy, and then you you know the coronial inquest, which can be drawn out for years and years, and that gives you closure. But I think for that period of time, it's it's normal to think, oh gee, what did I miss? You know, what what was the actual cause of death? Was it something preventable? Did I do things right? How is the coroner going to look at what I've done? And and so I think that really fuels that rumination uh, fire. And 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 then of course in these scenarios, because it was it was made to mine and the buck stopped with me uh, mm. in the field. Um, that that just compounded this this pressure and this pressure I was putting on myself and and then uh, yeah and then the, the ongoing combat operations and so it I did do a lot of that that ruminating at the time and and that really drove me into a, a little bit of a frenzied state where I threw myself into my own training and also the training of the medics uh, while we were deployed to to just I, I think part of me at that point. There was no doubt there was distraction. I wanted to stay occupied, but also I wanted to make sure that I had my skills as as sharp as I possibly could so that if there was another casualty that I could save, that that I had my best opportunity and that all the medics that that I had the the, uh, ability to run training for were at the best of their game as well so that they could have a, a good casualty outcome, ideally, or if not, they could reflect on the scenario and know that they did all that they could. And so, it, the, you know, I think there's a huge difference even in the setting where someone was killed. The, the mental health consequence of the person that responds is often dictated by how well they respond. And so if they come to that scenario and they're overwhelmed and they don't feel that they have any power to influence the situation, and then that's, that's a disaster. And whether they would have made a difference or not is, is probably inconsequential to how they reflect on that. Mm. Whereas if they can engage and go through their processes and the, the person still dies, that's it's still a disaster, but at least personally they can say, well, I did this, did what this, I could. this. Yeah, exactly right. And mm. so from a mental health perspective, that's huge. And it falls back on how well trained these people are as to whether they can respond in those uh, complex environments. After you finished serving, did you have a period of time where you didn't have anything to do but think about what had happened? Yeah. So that was, <laughs> that was, that was uh, and, and I hadn't, uh, I've spoken about this in the past and written a couple of articles in reflection on this. And, and so that was when I discharged at the start of 2014, I got out and I'd accumulated a, a, a bunch of leave, almost a year of leave. It was a bit hard to, to get leave in uh, the period that I was serving. And so I had all this leave, had some long service leave and got out. And I had, I had viewed that as it was going to be a, you know, this fantastic uh, period of time where I was, I was going to be home. We'd just had our third son in uh, mid-2013. Yeah. And so I was, I was home with the three little kitties with my wife. I, uh, the, the army pays well enough, but, um, but certainly as a civilian doctor, I could make a whole bunch more cash. So I rolled into a job that, that doubled my wage, if not more. Yeah. Uh, so I was earning a bunch of money. 
I was home, I was safe and, and there with the family. Should have been perfect. Should have been, yeah, yeah. On paper, it looked great. In, in practice, it uh, it didn't play out quite that well. And so I think the I, I, thankfully I had enrolled in a, a master of business administration. So I knew that I was I was at risk of being if I had nothing to do, that would be that would be a, a disastrous sort of situation for me. So I enrolled in this MBA, so I at least had a focus, and then went on leave for for about 10 months before I started working again. And, and that was the period of time where I, I really slowed down and, and was able to, well, I guess things caught up with me was probably. <laughs> so did that rumination really corrupt that happy situation or was just that just the time that the process needed to take place and it was what it was? Uh, I think probably the latter. Yeah, yeah, I think it was. And throughout the, that five years, in that environment, I'd, as I said, I, I didn't register the the significance of a lot of the events. I didn't acknowledge that there was was these unusual exposures building up, and they were because there was so many of them. Yeah, that's right. And right. where did and, you begin? Yeah, exactly right. And I've looked back on this, and I, I think of it as a, and we see this across the board. It's not unique to military people, you know, first responders, police officers. Uh, ambulance officers and, and paramedics. I mean, that's that's a group that just gets exposed constantly, day in, day out, to mm. to you know the, these horrendous traumas and little kids drowning in domestic violence and old people having heart attacks and dying on them. And it's it's cumulative. But the problem with those environments, and it was no different with us, is you get a training to go into those environments. You get a stress inoculation in your training, so you can go into those environments. And and cope. You can go in and you can do your role and and often get a good outcome. Sometimes get a bad outcome, but you can function there. And as you get more experience, you can approach more and more traumatic experiences. And and maybe the first or second time you you see their body, or in our instance, see someone shot blown up, that leaves a bit of a um, impression. But by the time you hit your tenth, twentieth, thirtieth dismembered body or blown apart person, or um, you know high velocity gunshot wound. It doesn't even register, and because you become desensitized, and so, uh, but because it doesn't register, does that mean it doesn't go somewhere? No, no. This is the thing. So it doesn't consciously register, mm. but subconsciously it's going in. It adds to that build up. Yeah, yeah, spot on. And so I think that bucket's filling, but you don't know it's filling. And this is the this and so that's is why the, you'd say I'm fine because yeah. you literally think you, think you, you are. are. Well, you are. You are consciously fine, but subconsciously mm. you start to get these these sort of signals and this anxiety and this uh, hypervigilance, all these things that serve you well when you're in a, a, a high stress you can't environment, switch it off. can't turn it off and it's still there and you don't, you don't, you don't know where the off switch is. And no, you don't know why it's happening too. Yeah. And yeah. really hardened people who've been through all these situations and might be at a point where it's been such a build up and now you're starting to feel some of these symptoms and think, I oh, was it that last experience I had? Cause that was no worse than 10 other ones I could name. Yeah. And actually it's, it's the consequence of years of going through this and the fact that no human being is actually immune to seeing and going through all of that stuff, even if we might feel like we are. Spot on. Yeah, we're all human at the end of the day. And and exactly as you said, you it might be one situation that that tips you over. And and like you say, you might think, well, I've seen a dozen of them before. You know, why why that one? But that just happens to be the one that that overfills your trauma bucket and, yeah. and it starts to to spill over. And and I think that that um, you know, that traumatic adaptation, that normalization of these exposures is a real trap and, and you don't have a reference point because everyone next to you and around you is being exposed the same. You're all mm. on the same uh, traumatic slippery slope. And so, so it's normal. Yeah, it's normal yeah. that your benchmark is the people around you and they're all having the same exposures and, and so it, it all gets normalized. Yeah. And and so you go on and you get more and more of these exposures and and yeah, no one ever stops to think, hey, is is this normal for a human to be exposed to these things? And and like I said, it's it's certainly not just soldiers. This is this is all our first responders. Uh, all but our- to to an extent, it's, it is completely necessary as well. Yes. Like you can't be normal and do those jobs because it just you wouldn't be able to do it. Like you have to be able yeah. to find a way to cope with it. But of course, you are still a human being. You know that doesn't change. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Y- you're right. I think a certain kind of person is drawn towards all of these first responder roles. 
In the special operations environment, there's of course some fairly uh, tough selection processes that that people go through to get accepted into these units, and then a really uh, sort of thorough reinforcement training cycle to. And that's that's that whole selection, looking for a, a physically and psychologically resilient individual to put into the training pipeline, and then a whole bunch of stress inoculation that happens in that training pipeline to equip someone to then go into a combat environment and function well. And that, that allows them to then have access to these environments where they can experience massive amounts of trauma and they can endure it for years and years and years and years. And the training has to be that extreme because yeah. when shit hits the fan and there's bullets flying, if you're not conditioned to that level and you freeze, you die yeah. and your mates die too, potentially. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly right. It, it needs to be hyper-realistic and, and indeed the SAS regiment has lost more soldiers in training than it has in operations and that's no, because that. the training has to be so... Uh, Realistic. It yeah. has to be the real thing to to desensitise soldiers to the stress of the the combat environment. And we hear a lot about post traumatic stress, but what about post traumatic growth? Can you tell us about the elements of that? Yeah, it's an interesting beast, and I think it's one that that I, every opportunity I get, I try and talk to. And it's it's I think the narrative in the contemporary media is is all gloom and doom about people who've experienced trauma and. And that you'll get post-traumatic stress almost guaranteed, and then once yeah, you, you're, you're in, broken forever and spot on, you're never yeah. the same again. Yes, but the reality is that that I think the statistics are around eighty percent of people who who have post-traumatic stress will actually recover from that. It's only about twenty percent that will end up with post-traumatic stress disorder, mm. so a, a prolonged negative mental health sequelae from their trauma, and most most will recover to a to a, a baseline or near baseline level of function, so about 80%. And then there's a percentage that will experience post-traumatic growth. So this is becoming a better version of yourself because of the trauma. It's, it's, it's recalibrating. It's a, a renewed appreciation for life. It's increased gratitude. Like I said earlier, I'm, I'm, I'm honestly, truly on a daily basis, thankful that I've got legs. I'm thankful that my family on that particular day has not ended up in an emergency department or being diagnosed mm. with a horrendous condition or being and the trauma is a teacher. Yeah. So it, it, it redefines your perspective. And I've, I've, I've used the analogy. I had this great little, little badge, a little patch in one of my tours that, and it was, it was a little patch that depicted a, a meter with, with red, orange, and green. And the needle was firmly in the red and down the bottom, it said suck meter. And so, you know, it was, a, it was a sort of comical at the time, but I think it's a great uh, metaphor for post-traumatic growth. So you recalibrate your suck meter. What you used to think was it was a, a bad day. You know, you might have got a parking ticket or had a fight with. It's actually good for these reasons. Yeah, spot on. Hey, guess what? I'm, I'm still alive. I've still got my legs. I, yeah, you know, I've it was got a pretty a good over. day if you look at it that yeah, way. <laughs> it is. So yeah, I, I like to think of it as I've, I've recalibrated my suck meter. Everything's in the green now. It, yeah, it, it takes because the red for me, tipping out into the red like this little patch uh, was illustrating. Is, has now been recalibrated to kneeling in the dirt and watching one of my friends die and being, you know, powerless to yeah. save them. Your red is as red that, as it that's gets. That's my red, yeah. yeah. It doesn't get any redder. And yeah. then I, I look at, well, hey, hang on a sec. Maybe this 100 buck parking ticket isn't a big deal at all. Pay it, move on with my life. Yeah. And so it's, it's a recalibration of that suck meter, I think, is a great metaphor for this post-traumatic growth. What's the relationship between resilience and stress? So we, we've, in the Resilient Shield model, we've looked at that as being on two different sides of a set of scales. So we, you know, the resilient stress scale need to be in balance. Well, look, if for you to be in a, a healthy state of affairs, yes, they must be either balanced or stacked in the favour, tipped in the favour of resilience. Yeah. So if they tip in the other direction and your stress overwhelms your resilience, that's when you're going to start to have some either, you know, physical, if it's a physical stress or, or. Uh, psychological sequelae. But I think the, the, the other important factor when we're talking about the relationship is there can be no resilience without stress. Stress is a necessary part of us growing and evolving as human beings. If you don't have stress in your life, you can't develop and you can't build resilience. We jump to the conclusion that stress is a negative thing, mm. but it's an absolutely essential thing for us to move forward and evolve and thrive in life and to develop resilience. It's just a matter of the, the level of stress at what 
at what period in your developmental stages that that stress occurs, how you can respond to it, your coping mechanisms. And so stress is important, but it, it, uh, it needs to be in balance with resilience for people to be moving along. The Greek philosopher Epictetus said, man is affected not by events, but by his view of them. Mm. What's your experience around that or your learnings around that? Quite. Yeah, that's a, oh, gee, he's he's got some great stuff, and and we 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 draw a lot on the Stoics in uh, in the book, and and indeed in my life in general, I, I reflect a lot on uh, sort of Epictetus and and uh, Marcus Aurelius and some of those you know great Stoics. I think that philosophy is really fantastic. Yeah, same. But the, yeah, yeah, it's uh, there's some sage stuff there. But look, I, I think we we talk about the, this concept of perceptual stress, which I don't think we coined that term, but it's basically there's an absolute stress or so this this event that's occurred or this bill that's due uh, or this this fight that we've had with our significant other or this ding in our car, you know, they're, they're absolutes. That's the that's what's happened. Yeah. And then there's how we choose to view that that bigger picture, and and we can amplify these absolute stress ors massively out of proportion with this perceived stress. And, Which and is it, down to us, how yes, we respond. and that's on us. Yeah, yeah, we get to choose that. And then that drives our emotions, which is a fascinating thing. Like we, we fuel most of our own emotions. And there's some, some excellent research we talked to in the book looking at emotional states in terms of a, a biochemical process of releasing the, the neurotransmitters and the hormones that, that make you angry or make you happy or make you, you know, any, any range of emotions only lasts for about 90 seconds. Mm. And then whether that state perpetuates, we actually have control over. Those neurotransmitters and hormones, we can change our emotional state and allow them to dissipate and change, our, or we can perpetuate them. Our and, thinking does that. Yes. Yeah, it is, a, it is our choice. And most people, it happens subconsciously and most people, and this is where rumination really plays into it. And if you can catch that happening. So you might've had an argument with someone you're hot under the collar, you get a stress response to that. You, you might have said something regrettable or they've said something that's hurt you or a physical altercation, you know, in the extreme. There's a bunch of chemicals being released there. That's your fight or flight response and that's wired into us. That happens. But whether we choose to perpetuate that depends on, uh, on whether we catch that happening after the fact and whether we, we can ruminate on that and think about what we wish we had a said or what we're going to do or how much we dislike this person or mm. whatever else. And, and that's, then we'll keep feeling that. Exactly. We're yeah. fueling the fire. Or we can say, hey, that's done. You know, it's over. It's in the past. I'm going to allow myself to calm down. And if you've got other strategies like some breathing techniques and other adaptive coping strategies, you can- and That's why holding a grudge, for example, will mess you up, not the other yeah. person because you're still experiencing those feelings. Exactly right. And that's the, okay, I'm going to butcher this quote or who it's by. It might be Buddha. I'm not sure, but talking about holding on to a coal, it, it only burns you and, yeah. and not the other person. But yeah, it's so true. A lot of the stuff that we choose to, to hold on to, which most, mostly will be done subconsciously. We're, we're not, I don't think anyone's saying I'm going to, you know, keep this in mind so that I continue to feel furious. It's, but most of the stuff that we that stresses us is these these perceptual uh, stress bubbles around the absolute stress or and if you can strip them back you can you can really bring things into focus and minimize that stress and give you a better chance of keeping your resilient stress scales in balance and the stoics live by the mantra memento mori mm. which is remember death yes why is that useful to us to remind ourselves of our mortality i mean it sounds pretty morbid to to wake up each day and think you know i might die today but i think most of us we, we, we of course all know we are going to die but it seems so far away and so distant that you you don't you don't live like you're going to die you you put things off you you don't tell people that you love them you don't you know write that letter of appreciation all these things you, you think you got time yeah that's exactly right and it's not until you, you get a nasty diagnosis or heaven forbid you, you lose someone uh, close to you it, it, w without warning. And I know you've experienced that, Callum, and, and uh, as have I, and certainly uh, experienced that personally, but also professionally as a, a doctor and working in, in places like emergency departments and in intensive care units, you, you see how fate can intervene at you know any time. And you, it, it gives you this focus that you need to, well, not so much live every day like it's your last because you'd go and blow all your cash and, and so that's probably unrealistic. But, but I think the, and the, the other thing, having worked in palliative care as well, I, I'd spent some time doing some palliative care work in a little hospital and you see people coming to the end of their life and, uh, you know, that was a real privilege and, and to be involved in 
in providing a, a dignified and, and pain-free death for people, but you'd see the families and you could see what was important. And it wasn't about the, you know, the job that they might have had or the car that they might have drove or this or that or the other. It was that human connection. And and you know, you could see it people in their final weeks. And some of them had these families rallying around them. And and, and I experienced this myself. Our father uh, passed away from lung cancer a few years ago and was um, was went through the palliative care process. And mm-hmm. and for us, it was a really wonderful closure, you know. And, and thankfully, we had time from his diagnosis to when he passed away uh, to – there wasn't anything unsaid anyway. But, I mean, we had that time to get used to the idea that, that uh, we were going to lose dad. But it was a it was a, a wonderful experience, and his funeral was this overwhelmingly positive celebration of his life, and and that was all because there was nothing that had been left unsaid. We had a you know this fantastic relationship, and 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 let each other know that we we loved and appreciated them. And failure to do that, I think, is what leads to these these terrible situations post someone's passing. That uh, and so that that whole keeping death in focus, I think gives us a good perspective and, and also just the, the, once again, like the recalibrating the suck meter and looking at an absolute stress or, and, and really how important is this when you, you think one day I'm going to die, I'm not going to be on this planet anymore. When you look at the, if you even want to get a bit more, uh, sort of philosophical, you look at the, the, the extent of human existence or the magnitude of the, the universe yeah. and you, it you're, so, to, you're so insignificant. Yeah. In the grand scheme, we all are, but we, but we're very significant in our own lives, of course, but it's, it's trying to keep perspective on that. And having experienced so much death, how do you view your own now? Oh, look, I, I certainly am not, uh, scared of the idea. I think the, there's still a, you know, a, I'll embrace it when it comes, I guess. I'm not going to go looking for it though. But um, yeah, I think it's it's something that of course will happen. I hope it doesn't happen before my time, but but I I make the, the conscious point of every single opportunity I get of hugging my kids, telling my wife I love her and that she's beautiful and that she's the best mum that I know of, uh, you know, and, and just reinforcing with my kids that I'm so proud of them. And that they're you'll get some brownie points and, for slipping that in there, mate. I'm oh, sure. She won't listen to this, mate. Yeah, she's, she's never. <laughs> oh, come never, on. <laughs> no, 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 not because of you, because of me. Yeah, she, oh, she, she's sick of hearing oh, you. Oh, mate, yeah, she just can switches up. Yeah, the eyes glaze over, and <laughs> you've she, heard yeah. it all before. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. But no, I think it. Um, you know, from my perspective, it's 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 about trying to live the best life that that I possibly can, and try and you know push the the boundaries of what I'm capable of as a, a human. Uh, while I'm here, and hopefully, if uh, if at all possible, try and make a, a positive impact on on other people if that's achievable. But just try and live by my values and, and principles and do the best I can uh, while I'm still here. Yeah, that's all we can do. Yeah. And why the resilience shield? So that fell out of the the observation of that that rocky period that that I had when I got out of defence and and w- starting to get what was. What what was symptoms of post traumatic stress? Like plain and simple, no two ways about it. As a doctor, I recognised exactly what that was. But just that that paradox of it occurring at a time where I was never safer. So I mean, I'd I'd, I'd had this five year period where we, you know everything we discussed earlier was occurring, and this really wasn't affecting me tremendously there. And then all of a sudden, here I am earning stack more cash. I'm safe. I'm home. I'm with my kids, with my wife, and and everything's rosy on paper. But yet I was really struggling. And, and so that, from a, a personal perspective, I was, was living it and experiencing it. From a, viewing it through a professional lens, I could see exactly what was happening. And I was trying to work out the roadmap back to a good place, basically. And so for me, it helped to codify what was happening. And so to look at the, the scientific, the medical, the psychological literature and say, okay, this checks out. This is what's happening to me. This is why it's happening. So therefore, if I can reverse that, I should be able to get back to a, to a better place. And, and a lot of it came from the, the uh, loss of purpose, the loss of personality from discharging. And, but also it, it got me thinking about what was it about the construct of being a part of a group like special operations that allowed all of us to go into these high-pressure environments and not only function, but thrive. Like, why, why was that the case there? And yet here I am as a safe civilian and I'm struggling. And, and so mm. that started to, to lead to this looking at resilience. What is resilience? And, and that led to what, what do we know from the evidence that 
that is causative of resilience? What is the what do the, does the science tell us? And and then that led to well, okay, I, I had that when I was part of the SAS regiment. Uh, how can I rebuild that outside of of the, that environment? How can I rebuild myself into someone resilient? And and so it started to become a bit of a roadmap for me to try and get myself back on track. And around that that period of what was years after my discharge, uh, my brother Ben, who was a, a SAS uh, officer, ended up the commanding officer at the unit and had done a, a bunch of trips as well, had his own experiences. And another uh, ex-SAS officer called Tim Curtis, who and the three of us wrote the Resilient Shield together, were all starting to do engagements with, uh, with government groups, with businesses, looking around resilience, leadership, these kind of things, trying to take some of our lessons learnt from our military experience and apply that to a, a more broader construct. And that all came together in, in the resi- what, what turned out to be the Resilient Shield uh, project and in which we've written the book about. And so it was all sort of had its genesis there and then came together as uh, over a period of years. But we need a resilient shield, whether we like it or not. And there's certain things we can do to build that up. The book's full of stories, but it's also hugely instructional. Obviously, a massive amount of research has gone into it. It's quite a big book as well, and it's out now. Just let us know where we can get it. Yeah, absolutely. So it's Australia and New Zealand. It's available in, in bookstores. So you can walk in, buy a hard copy. You can get it off all the major book retailers, so your Amazons and, and what have you. It's on. Uh, we've recorded the audio, so you can pick it up on, on audio book through um, the Audibles. And internationally, it's available. Do we on, get to hear your lovely voice? You on do, that? my dulcet tones. So, yeah, the three of us, we, we split that up. And so Ben Ben starts off, I do the middle chapters, and then uh, Tim narrates the the final few chapters. And, and then for all of our personal vignettes, we, we uh, narrate them ourselves. Cool. Beautiful, mate. Well, thanks so much for writing it and for helping so many people, putting all that together, doing all that work. I think it does make a massive impact and so much of what you learned in an extreme environment translates to civilian life, although many of us wouldn't imagine it, but we're all humans as we've talked yeah. about today and we all need resilience and it can be a very airy fairy term about what does that mean, where does it come from and the book actually explains a lot of that and gives you a lot of tools and things you can actually implement in order to really build resilience and for that reason i think it's well worth people going out and buying it so i hope plenty of people do yeah no cheers for that callum it's yeah and that was the whole goal was to try and break resilience down into something that was usable i think we all understand what it is loosely we get it but then when you you say to them well what 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 adds up to resilience it's like well i'm not really sure and then take it a step further and say what can you be doing on a day-to-day basis to build your overall resilience and people get really lost and most people are doing a lot of these things, but not consciously doing them to build resilience. And that was the, the, the main goal of that book was to, to break it down, say, here's what we know builds resilience. Here's how you can do it across all the layers of the resilience shield on a day-to-day basis to, to maintain your resilience. That's it for this episode. If you're getting some value out of the show, please help us out with a quick rate and review on Apple Podcasts. All our podcasts are recorded in video, so follow Young Blood Men's Health Matters on Instagram and Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Young Blood Media, to get the full picture. And please leave us a comment if anything resonates. We love hearing from you. You're more than welcome to join our inner circle by signing up for our e-news through our website, youngbloodmedia.com.au. And most importantly, please share this podcast with anyone in your life who might need it. We're all about reaching as many people as we can. Until next time, this is Youngblood. Thanks for being part of the mission.